Hello and welcome. Thank you for participating in Moorhead at Home Skywatching, hosted by Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. My name is Amy Sale and I'm an educator at Moorhead. Um, we are located on campus. We're a, uni a unit of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We also work throughout the state through a number of science outreach initiatives like our mobile lab vans, our summer camp programs, and the annual North Carolina Science Festival. Our mission is to help people better understand science, technology, and health, and we do this through engaging learning opportunities like this live virtual event. Our topic today is May Carolina Skies. We're glad to have you, and Nick will get us started. Hey, everybody. I uh, hope you're doing well today. Thanks for joining us for Moorhead at Home. Uh, my name is Nick Eeks, and uh, as Amy mentioned, we're going to be showing you a little bit of what's up in the May skies. So if you've never been with us for one of these Moorhead at Home sessions, basically, we're going to take about 15 or 20 minutes to talk about a topic. And uh, after that, we're gonna take some time to answer your questions. So I wanted to tell you right now, the best way to ask a question is to use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a question about something we're talking about or something you're interested in, uh, put it in that box and we will try our best to get to it at the end. So we also wanted to say that we miss seeing you uh, on UNC's campus at our uh, Full Dome Theater. We miss seeing you at your schools. Um, we hope you had a happy Mother's Day, and uh, I wanted to give a quick shout out to some of our gra graduating seniors uh, who graduated UNC uh, this past weekend. I know it's not a normal graduation, but uh, especially our friend Jordan, who's helping us out with some of these webcasts today, I wanted to give you a shout out uh, because we're really proud and, and happy to work with you. So um, we know it's not you know a normal graduation time, but we can still come together and, and uh, be with each other virtually. So on to our sky. Uh, if, if this is your first time with us, we're gonna uh, be using a program called Stellarium, which is kind of like a flat screen planetarium uh, to simulate or pretend that we're looking up at the real sky. So if you're watching this live with us right now, um, it's about 10 a.m. Uh, here on the 12th of May, uh, but we're gonna be able to change that time a little bit. So the first thing that's gonna happen is I'm going to share my screen and give us a look at the sky. Now, if this is not your first session with us and you've been with us before, you might notice that this looks a little different uh, than how we usually have it set up. Namely, I see a bunch of water here. Um, a lot of times when we're doing our stargazing, we have a view that kind of looks like a big field or a big uh, forest of trees. Well, there is a reason why we're looking out towards the water, and it's not just because we wish we were at the beach right now. Um, so we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but I wanted to point out a couple of things uh, before we begin and before uh, we give you our first poll question. Namely, um, I want y'all to pay, pay attention to the date and time that we're gonna move through uh, during our session today. So the best place to find that is kind of near the bottom of your screen. Uh, you'll, you'll see that I have a bar here right underneath south in this view that tells us the date. Uh, this number 2020 tells us the year. 05 tells us that it's May, the fifth month. 12, that's today, the 12th. Right beside that, we have a clock that tells us it's 10.04 or a little bit after. Um, and you'll see that those seconds are moving up um, because we're here in real time. So just keep your eyes on that because uh, we're gonna show you what's happening today and tonight in the sky, but we're also gonna change, change it a little bit throughout. Okay, now that we have some of our housekeeping out of the way, we have a question for you. Um, before we get into our stargazing up here, it probably just popped up on your screen. Uh, the question is, which of these objects are you most interested in seeing in the sky? So go ahead and give us your ideas. You see we have four options up there, the moon, planets, stars, or satellites. So of course there's no right answer. We just kind of want to see what y'all are interested in seeing. Um, we'll give you just a couple moments to do that. Um, I have in mind what my favorites are, but they're probably different than yours, and it's okay. So again, our options are the moon, planets, stars, and satellites. Well, Nick, now I'm super curious what your favorites are. Are you going to tell us, or will you leave <laughs> us in suspense? Um, well, it's kind of a cop out, but my favorites are all of them. I like looking for all of them in the sky. My, my very favorite might be the planets, but that's just me. Um, um, I don't want to spoil anybody's, uh, anybody's votes here. So 
Um, let's see what you picked. Ah. Oh, Nick, <laughs> people agree with you. <laughs> hey, well, that's nice. <laughs> um, so it looks like about 10% of us chose the moon, which you're in luck if you chose that. Um, almost half of us, almost 50% of us, 46% said the planets, 23% uh, said the stars, and 21% said satellites. So I'm just glad everything got a vote because they're all very interesting in their own way. Um, and as we move through the week, you know, whether it's Thursday's session or next week, we're, we're going to talk about lots of these things. Yeah, and I'll put in a plug for this Thursday in particular. We're going to focus on one particular satellite, the International Space Station. There's a number of good visible passes coming up for North Carolina. So tune in again Thursday, 10 a.m. if you want to learn more about the International Space Station and how to see it. Yeah, that one should be really fun. Well, moving to our sky, one thing and one reason why we have this ocean view, one thing that we wanted to point out is that one of those objects is up in the sky right now. Um, and you can notice it's kind of close to the horizon down here. But what is that object, Amy? That looks to me like the moon. And I'm wondering if some people are noticing that X4 next to it and wondering what that means. Yeah, so with our, our program here, uh, Stellarium, we actually have to zoom in on the moon and show it four times larger than it would normally be on the screen so that it appears at all. Um, it's kind of like if you use the telescope or binoculars from your backyard, it's going to zoom in the moon more than it usually would be. It scales it up. Um, so that yeah, and it. by the way, we do that inside Moorhead Planetarium as well. The, the moon and sun are not quite actually the right size. We make them look a little bigger, which actually makes it look correct to you. Otherwise, you would think it was really weird looking. Yeah. So um, we can give you an up close view of the moon um, here, as if we had a telescope or binoculars. We're um, in our waning gibbous phase and um, might even notice there's a planet label right there. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, though, but at this time of the morning, um, since the sunlight's so bright, you would not be able to see Jupiter. But never fear, we'll talk about some planets uh, here in just a moment. Okay. All right. Well, we're actually going to change our view. So you notice that we have some of these big red letters along the bottom of our screen that tell us our cardinal directions or which way we're facing. So right in front of us right now is south. Over on our left is east, over on our right is west. We're actually going to kind of move our screen around so that we can face towards the west. Why would we do that uh, today, Amy? Well, we're um, talking about what you can see in the sky this particular month, May 2020. And um, you all told us a lot of you are really interested in planets. And in the evening sky you know, after sunset, the planet action is in the West right now. So, um, and some of these things are kind of low in the West. So that's why we've got an ocean view. So we don't have any trees to block the way. Um, so let's see what happens as the sun goes down. And, um, and then Nick, I think we're gonna try to stop it um, after sunset at a time that roughly matches the star chart that you can find online at our website, moreheadplanetarium.org under the Moorhead at Home section in the additional activities and information. There's a link to the May star chart. All right, what time did we stop right there? It looks like it's just before 9 p.m. So if you're still looking at our clock, you, it might look a little funny to you because it says 2054. Um, we're using a 24 hour clock for military time. So 20 actually uh, equals, in, in this case, 8 p.m. So this is 854 p.m. Okay, so as you can see, it's not even totally dark yet, but things are starting to come out. Um, Stellarium represents brighter objects by using bigger dots. So you might look around and see if you can figure out what's the brightest object in the Western early evening sky tonight, May 12th, 2020. What do you think, Nick? You know, I see some really bright stars and other than that bright sunset glow, I think, I think the brightest thing might be this planet. I think you're right. Venus. 
Venus is really absurdly bright, actually. And if you haven't spotted it in the evening sky, you need to do it soon because Venus is uh, moving in its orbit around the sun. We on Earth are moving in our orbit around the sun in such a way that um, by June 3rd, Venus will appear to be in the same line of sight with the sun, which means you're not going to be seeing it in the nighttime sky. So look over the next week or two if you want to spot Venus. Um, and it's very, very bright, brighter than any of the stars in the nighttime sky. And if you look closely, you might see there's another planet hanging out in that evening twilight glow really close to the horizon, Mercury. All right, well, um, planets move against the background of the stars. So you're not gonna see Venus and Mercury in the same locations, in these same locations next month, next May, the May after that, um, planets move. So we can actually see this, um, how they move relative to the other things around them if we um, fast forward time. So Nick, do you wanna take us, through, take us through a few days and maybe explain what you're doing? Sure, absolutely. So we're looking west. So imagine you're you know, in your backyard looking in that same direction. It is 8.56 p.m. And you're going to notice the time doesn't really change. But what I'm going to change is the date. So I'm going to move forward one day. And you might notice that it moves us from May 12th to May 13th. So just imagine that you're going out at the exact same time every evening and taking a picture of the same part of the sky. That's kind of like what we're doing right now. Um, so it's still a little before 9 o'clock on the 13th. And you might have noticed that it looked like Mercury and Venus almost moved a little bit. So what do you think, Amy? Should we keep going forward? I think we should. Let's see what, let's see what happens. And everybody who's watching, you might make some predictions about what's, what's going to happen next. What date are we on now? We've moved to the 15th, so a few days from now. 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th. Here is May 20th, okay. um, eight days from now. So what do you think is gonna happen next? Yeah, so everybody make a prediction. You, you've probably noticed Mercury and Venus, uh, Mercury is noticeably moving, it looks like it's moving towards Venus. I don't know if you've also noticed, but Venus has also been changing positions relative to that star that looks like it's above it right now. It's been sort of pulling away from it a little bit. Okay, so what's gonna happen on May 21st? Let's find out. There we go, looks even closer. Oh, wow, they look almost. I don't know, Nick, what do you think? Are Mercury and Venus really practically on top of each other? Is there really a planet pileup going on? There is unfortunately not a planet pileup, or maybe it's fortunate because we wouldn't want planets to crash into each other. Um, it just turns out that from where we are on the Earth, Venus and Mercury look like they're in the same direction. Um, they have their own paths, their own orbits around the sun. Um, and depending on where we are in our orbit and where they are, sometimes we line up. I think that's what we're getting here on the uh, on the 21st of May. It, it looks like they've uh, they're in the same direction for us. Yeah, so still millions of miles apart. And then what do we think is going to happen on the 22nd? Oh, look at that. There we go. And um, you know, I think something interesting happens on the 23rd if you look closely. Oh, somebody joined the the planet party there. <laughs> A thin, thin waxing crescent moon on the 23rd. And so you can see you'd have to be out early in the evening after sunset, there'd still be some glow over there to the west. And uh, these objects are going to be low to the horizon. Before we, um, you know, move a little later in our night, I kind of want to get an up close view of Mercury. Um, it's right. one of those planets that we don't often get to look at um, through our telescope because it's either appearing right after the sunset or right before the sunrise. But here in Stellarium, we can zoom in and get a look. Wow, it kind of looks familiar to me. What does that look like to you, Amy? Yeah, it looks to me like Earth's moon. Look at that, and it goes through phases as well. Yeah, you see it's not completely lit up. 
So what we're seeing right now is the daytime side of Mercury, this side that's being lit up by the sun is incredibly hot, but you notice it does have some similar features to our moon. It has craters and rays and things like that because it is a, a rocky, rocky object that um, doesn't have a big atmosphere. So some of those um, places where things have kind of whacked into it throughout, throughout history, they're still evident to us. We can still see them. So it's a unique view to be able to get to see Mercury up close. Yeah, Mercury is um, hard to spot in the sky. It never strays far from the sun from our point of view. It orbits the sun in uh, closer than we do. Um, but Nick, I wonder if we can show people the challenge that they're going to have in seeing um, Mercury and Venus as Absolutely. this month goes on. What I'm going to do is zoom and us I'm out. And we're gonna go back to a view. You notice that I kind of wiggled you around there a little bit. Um, we're going back to a view towards the south. Mercury and Venus and the moon are over here. Um, again, this is uh, a couple weeks um, into the future here, but you notice we have our ocean view right now. Um, that's not realistic to what it's gonna look like in your backyard. So here in Stellarium, we can actually change that view. You notice I'm bringing up a window that says landscape. And we have all sorts of different options here. So if you ever, you know, want to play around with this program yourself, you can try those out. Um, but my favorite one is a small French village. Um, and it's the town where the program Stellarium was born, which I think is kind of cool. So you might notice if I move my window here, even here a couple weeks in the future, I'm going to take us back to today just to be accurate. Um, what's in the way over here of seeing Mercury and Venus? Ah, uh, yes, the, the bane of every North Carolinian's uh, existence when trying to skywatch. Trees, we love our trees, but they often get in the way. Um, I actually, right before we started here live, I ran outside and down the block and tried to catch the moon, um, which at this moment as we speak live is setting <laughs> in the West, and there were, there were trees in the way. I couldn't find it. Yeah. Um, so this may happen to you when you try to stargaze. And that's okay, you know, when it's safe to do so and, and, and in the safest way possible, it's fun to get into an open space um, to be able to not have the trees in your way. But for now, we might have to deal with some trees as we're stargazing. So I see we're starting to run a little short on time, so maybe we should start showing people um, some things that are actually really well placed in the sky. So moving from planets over to stars. Um, we did a session earlier on star hopping with the Big Dipper, so we're going to review some of that. Um, and we'd love to show you how to find the Big Dipper and then how to use it to star hop or to get your way to other things that you can see in the spring sky. So um, if you have ever heard that name, the Big Dipper, it's one of the most commonly found in most famous shapes that we see up in the sky. But it turns out that the Big Dipper is not a constellation. And that might sound kind of weird to some of us, but the Big Dipper is part of a larger constellation. Uh, so we call the actual Dipper part an asterism or just a familiar grouping of stars. So to find this Big Dipper, what you need to look for are seven bright stars. They kind of look like they're in the shape of a big spoon uh, that you would dip into a pot of soup. That's kind of where that name comes from. So we'll give you just a moment to look around. I know you're probably saying, Nick, I see lots of seven bright stars. That's okay. Uh, we're going to point it out for you in just a second. Um, I'll give you a hint from your perspective right now. It's going to kind of be at the top of your screen. Um, so not down near where my numbers are, not down near the uh, big red letters um, or even near the Western horizon that we looked at earlier. Um, the Big Dipper is going to be high overhead. So hope you found it. I'm going to go ahead and point it out for you. We have three stars in the handle. One, two, three, and four stars that make up the bowl. One, two, three, four. And if you use your imagination, maybe you can see that as a big soup spoon. And we can help you out here a little bit. I'm gonna click on one of these stars and outline the entire shape of the larger constellation. So you notice not only that dipper part is illuminated here, um, there's a lot of other connect the dot lines here. This entire shape um, from, from ancient mythology and things like that, we, we know it as Ursa Major or the Big Bear. 
So the Big Dipper has a little bit more to it than just our soup spoon. But as Amy mentioned, that soup spoon and these seven bright stars, they're going to help us star hop to some other objects too. But maybe if you use your imagination, you can see a big bear up there in the sky. So where's our first star hopping destination, Amy? Well, I think um, maybe we should fill up that dipper, the bowl of the dipper with water and then let it drip out the bottom onto the back of an animal that would probably prefer not to be immersed in water. Some of you may have these at home. A cat, there's a giant cat in the sky. There's the back, oh, and it's Leo the lion. And um, the easiest part I think of Leo to see, so we're dripping the bottom of the bowl to the back of Leo, is um, you might notice there's a backwards question mark. See if you can find the backwards question mark. You can think of that as the lion's head or mane, and that star that Nick is highlighting is um, often seen as the heart of the lion, Regulus. And then there's also a back triangle of stars, three stars that form the hindquarters or the tail of the lion. So if you need some imagination help, there's an image of our lion. And you might draw it in a different way, and that is totally okay. Yeah, so remember, nothing official. Gonna about the pictures. <laughs> yeah, nothing official. So remember, fill up that dipper with water and it's an old constellation, so it's gonna leak right onto the back of the lion. Awesome. Okay. Hey, so we got well, to, I think... yeah. We should use that handle next, I think. Ooh, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, that's what I was gonna say. We used part of the big dipper of the bowl here. Let's use the handle. You might notice, or let's take our pictures down for a second at least. You might notice that these three stars make what looks kind of like a curve. Another word for a curve is an arc. And that's really handy for us because we can use those three stars to arc our way to Arcturus. Very bright star, you see it's even labeled here for us. But if you follow that arc of the Big Dipper, you can find another bright star and another constellation. So what is this constellation Boaties, Amy? What is that all about? Well, he's um, often seen as a herdsman. Uh, we personally at Moorhead Planetarium think it looks more like an ice cream cone. So we actually have a picture of an ice cream cone that we'll be delighted to show you once we can have shows inside our planetarium again. But I think if we show a picture, Solarium probably has Boatees as a herdsman. Takes a lot of imagination power there, but um, <laughs> we can see it. <laughs> Maybe you all saw something else. Maybe you saw a, a kite or something or a tie or whatever, whatever you like to imagine is fine. Okay, so we've arced to Arcturus. I wonder if we could keep going. Sure. Um, you might notice that we're kind of following the brighter stars that we see here in the sky. So when we made our arc to Arcturus, what we can do now is hop right to our next brightest star in the sky. And we say we like to speed to Spica. So you notice we're gonna speed right down this way to Spica. It looks like it wanted to select a satellite there instead of my star, but that bright one's Spica, trust me. Um, and Spica is, is the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo, the maiden. So maybe you can imagine somebody lounging up there in our nighttime sky. I always think she looks like a flying superhero. <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so we've arced to Arcturus. We sped on to Spica. Where should we go next? Well, we could probably stay over here in the same neighborhood. And I'm always curious about what some of these stars that are maybe a little dimmer, what, what they're a part of. Yeah, maybe we should curve on to Corvus. Yeah. So you notice this is kind of smaller. Um, at least as far as the number of connect the dot lines go. It's smaller than some of the other constellations we were looking at. Um, but if you move right from Spica to this next bright cluster of stars, you can find a crow. It's a little bit hard to see there, but there's our friend Corvus. Or Corvus the crow or the raven. And I'm just going to tease a future segment I hope we do where we tell some of these stories. How that bear got that really long tail and why is there a crow in the sky? <laughs> Okay, we've, we've uh, arced to Arcturus, sped on to Spica, curved on to Corvus. Nick, you had one more, I think. 
one last thing just to kind of round out this part of the sky. We're going to move from Corvus and we're going to hop our way to Hydra, the largest constellation in our nighttime sky by area. So the amount of the sky that this constellation takes up is is more than any of the other ones. So um, you notice that it kind of looks like a big snake or serpent. So Excellent. with all that star hopping, it is okay if you don't remember each of these individual steps, but we find a star hop to be a really good way to find our way from place to place in the sky. So if you ever want reference, I know Amy mentioned it earlier, we have star charts that are online uh, and you can maybe find some of these, these shapes on there as well. But since we want to answer some of your questions, we need to go ahead and move along. We've, we've hung out here at about 9 p.m. all night. Um, what do you think, Amy? Do we need to finish our all-nighter? I, I think we should because there's so uh, many interesting things in the pre-dawn sky right now. May 2020. And so you notice we've passed midnight, by the way. So we're staying up really, really late. And it looks like the sky moves because we live on a spinning planet. And that's what gives us that illusion that the sky turns around us. Oh, look at this. The moon came back in the picture. And Nick, I see three planets. Yeah, some of these labels might almost look like they're in the way, but um, there are three planets here in the early morning pre-dawn sky. We have Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. So you notice my clock here says it's about 4.45 a.m. If you're an early bird that gets up that early, you can catch the planets. If you have a really late night, you can catch the planets. But either way, just before the sun rises is a really good time to see these. Um, and they're going to be very bright. Uh, not quite as bright as the moon, but they're going to be very bright and uh, um, might even get to see some detail of their color. You notice that even here in Stellarium, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars almost look like they're different colors. So the early bird gets the planets and sometimes you get the moon. The moon is always uh, moving though. So that's the configuration of where the moon is relative to those planets tomorrow morning. It was different this morning. If you happen to be up at four or five in the morning, you will have noticed the moon was actually in a different location. Okay, but you see that that view doesn't last for long because eventually you get the bright glow of the sunrise. So the moon will still be visible um, in, in the morning time tomorrow. So that, that's something you can still see even with that bright sunlight, but you notice the planets kind of seem to disappear. And okay. I see lots of really great questions. Um, Fantastic. Can try to get to as many as we can here. Um, trying to think where to start. Um, I, I think I'll start with a question that was asked pretty early on from Natalie. Can we ever see Uranus from Earth? And what about Neptune? Um, so uh, Uranus is technically, yes. It's not usually considered in the list of uh, planets visible to the unaided eye. I assume you're asking about planets visible to the unaided eye without needing binoculars or a telescope. You actually can't see Uranus. You have to have sharp eyesight and a really good sky without light pollution, and you have to know exactly where to look. Um, binoculars are seriously going to help. Now, Neptune, you are not going to see that unaided eye. That's going to be more of a binoculars telescope kind of thing. Great question. Um, I see a good one here. Um, from, from Kim, it says, will we be able to see Mercury or will the brightness of Venus outshine Mercury? And I think that's a really good question to clear up because you notice that they did seem to get pretty close together. They appeared in the same direction in the sky. But I, I think kind of the bigger problem rather than Venus's brightness uh, will be your view of the horizon. So in a couple of weeks, you remember we moved, moved through the days there. Um, Mercury should be high enough above the horizon if you don't have a tree in the way um, that you should be able to see it even with the brightness of Venus near it. Um, so uh, hopefully, I, I don't believe that Venus's brightness is going to kind of outshine Mercury. Yeah, that was a good question. Um, there was also one, I'm trying to find it again. Is it, Emily asked, is it easier to see the planets when the moon is new? Um, so when the moon is new, that's when it's with the sun in the sky. It's going to be up in the daytime. It's the far side that's being lit up. So a new moon you don't see. So you don't have the light 
coming from the moon then to mess up your <laughs> the rest of your night sky. So it's easier to see everything actually when the moon is new, everything except the moon. Um, planets though are pretty bright. So even when the moon is bright, when it's waning gibbous, waxing gibbous full, you, you still are, are likely to be able to notice the planets pretty easily because planets do tend to be quite bright. Okay, and Nick, we're about out of time. Do you see any that you wanna try to answer really quick? Yeah, I think there's one more that I can answer because we mentioned a handful of constellations that are visible tonight um, and we saw maybe six of them or something like that, but there are way more than six constellations. There's a question here that says, how many constellations are there? Well, officially there are 88 constellations. And I say officially because that's determined by a group um, of astronomers called the International Astronomical Union. So they got together and decided how we divide up the sky uh, and which area in the sky represents which constellation. So um, like Amy mentioned, when we were stargazing, the connect the dot lines and the pictures, those aren't the official things. The official thing is the, the region or the area of the sky um, where the astronomers kind of fit together their puzzle pieces. So we just saw a handful, but that's one of the most exciting things about stargazing is there are so many stories up there for us to explore. Right. Any other last minute questions you see here, Amy? I think um, there are so many great questions, but we are out of time. I do see that somebody asked specifically about the space station. Tune in Thursday. We're going to have a whole session about that. Thursday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Yeah, so on that note, we want to thank you all for um, tuning in to More Head at Home today. If you enjoyed this program and you want um, more content like this, please check out our website, www.moreheadplanetarium.org. Um, and you can find the More Head at Home page there. And there's a whole big list of things uh, that you can participate in, links to activities you can do and things like that. And we highly recommend you checking out our star charts uh, because that's going to be kind of like your paper guide to, to what we did today in Stellarium. And if you want any more information about um, other things that Moorhead's doing, uh, please check us out on social media, whether it's our Twitter at Moorhead Planet, uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you can search for Moorhead Planetarium and find us there. Uh, but as Amy mentioned, tune back in with us uh, on Thursday at 10 a.m. We'll talk all about the International Space Station. Bye, see you all Thursday. Have a great day.